im Game Design. <coughs> Big Applaus. I think so. All right, hey everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the left-hand path of game design. And here I go. Yeah, so thanks very much to Charlene for that good introduction. Um, you know, just to reiterate, senior lecturer in games at Falmouth University in Cornwall. Specialized in occult and games. Um, gotten to present at a lot of cool conferences, trend states, SB9. Uh, I'm a core team member at uh, Apocalypse Studios, where we're working on a game called Deadhouse Sonata, which is an action-adventure game in which you play the undead fighting against the living. And I've written some books on game design. One of them is called Game Magic, a Game Designer's Guide to Constructing Magic System. Uh, I've written a couple uh, editions of the book Quests, uh, which is about quest design. And I have my own law, which is Howard's Law of Occult Design. Anyway, um, here comes the outline of this particular session. Um, what I want to talk about is the left-hand path as a current, as a source of influence. Um, and to do that, I'm going to have to do a little bit of definition and history. And then I'm going to launch into two case studies briefly of two tabletop games, um, one of which is called Invisible Sun and its influence coming from Kenneth Grant. Uh, another of which is called Kult, and its influence coming from Thomas Carlson. Um, and this is all kind of leading toward the notion of spiritual transgression in games. Uh, and the takeaway is sort of six techniques of left-hand path ludomancy. I'm going to use that word ludomancy sometimes. I should say what it means. So um, I made it up. Um, it's from the Latin ludare and um, mantea, so divination or magic. So it's sort of the magic of games. Um, Cool. So um, the left-hand path, it's a current of influence in games and game design. And um, over there on what I guess is your right uh, is a quotation from the indie uh, game designer Alex T, who talks about walking a path to the left to the left. And you can actually see in the kind of um, you know, logo for his company, this sort of left hand, Black Oath Entertainment. You can also see um, Main Gauche, which is a supplement to the grimdark fantasy RPG Zweihander. And it literally means left hand. And because the left hand path is a current, um, there's worth in tracing its influence. Because if we can trace its influence even through just a couple of case studies, uh, we're better able to understand that influence and therefore tap into its energy uh, in our own practice. And, and so I'm using current in that sense that Kenneth Grant likes to use it, kalas, magical force, with connotations of the way that water flows, but also connotations of the way that uh, electricity energizes us. And um, I want to suggest to you that this current manifests through influence in the original meaning of that word, which is influx, energy sort of passing in. Um, so let's see if we can pick up that current. And you know, the, the purpose of this, I'm going to kind of um, forecast for you, foreshadow as it were. Um, I've got six techniques of ludomatic left-hand path work, um, reversing game-based symbol systems, developing anti-world, personifying forces of darkness, simulating sex, death, and dreams, embracing bleed, and we'll talk about what that means, and finally, contesting the light. So here we go. Um, to understand this current, we've got to trace it back to its historical wellspring. And the left-hand path is, as you know, a super complex concept. Um, I'm somewhat grounding it in its tantric origins. So I'm, I'm looking at this book, uh, Agora at the Left Hand of God, which, by the way, was required reading uh, for the cultist Sabbatai, for initiation in the cultist Sabbatai, I learned recently. Um, in addition, you know, I'm kind of drawing on Stephen Flowers, who has a, a, a very complex, controversial, and nuanced sense of, of that terminology. But really, I mean, let's go with that etymology. So uh, left hand path, you know, is Vama Marga, uh, as many of you know, left handed attainment, uh, sometimes transliterated as, as Vamachari, depending on how you do that. Um, there's an online Sanskrit translator, and I love the three translations of Vamachara there, black magic, left hand practices or doctrines of the tantras, and my favorite is the last one, behaving badly or in the wrong way. So left-hand path has a tantric origin with a focus on Saivite thought, which is the worship of Shiva. I love this quotation from the Brahmanda Purana. It's about as far as I can sort of trace the term. They all bowed to the great god and said the bathing with ashes, nakedness and left-handedness that goes against the grain. And that which is to be used or not to be used, Lord, we wish to know that. So um, the, the, the sort of... Um, 
Left-hand path tantric practitioners are the wandering ascetics known as the Agori. And the Agori practice transgressive spirituality. So they're meditating in graveyards, they're venerating skulls, they're smearing themselves in ashes. And they're doing this because um, you know, they're trying to sort of see with the, the, the third eye of Shiva. And what the third eye of Shiva does is it sees beyond duality. It sees beyond good or evil. It sees beyond uh, appropriate or inappropriate, serious or playful. And there's a playfulness that comes out of that. And again, uh, quoting from the Shiva Mahatma Statra, uh, the world considers you inauspicious, O destroyer of lust, who plays in the smash and smeared with the ash from funeral pyres wearing a necklace of human skulls with ghouls for comrades. And, and, you know, we can pay attention to that line, who plays in the smashan. The smashan is the burning grounds. It's, it's where bodies are, pre, are cremated, but there's a fearlessness that comes from seeing through the, eye, the eyes of non-duality that allows for play even in places where we don't expect it. <laughs> The other thing that I want to point out about the left-hand path, so traditional interpretation, you know, kind of contextualizes this within you know, some traditions of Indian society where the left hand is used for inauspicious acts, um, you know, kind of uh, toiletry functions and, and also potentially killing animals, which we'll touch on at the end of this talk. But what I also like is Stephen Flowers' kind of speculation that prana typically moves from left to right. So like from here to here, but to reverse that and to make prana or energy flow from right to left, contrary to nature and cosmic law, requires an exercise of the faculty of will. In other words, spiritual transgression, or as the Brazilian independent video game designer Vikintor likes to say, metaphysical transgression. And what I absolutely adore about this is this is his game Estigma, which is like a body horror arcade game. And it literally has an option in the menu called metaphysical transgression. How I would love if more games had that as an option. So let me give you two that do. Uh, on what would be your left is Invisible Sun. Uh, on what would be your right is Kult. These are two streams of the left-hand path current and they are influenced respectively by Kenneth Grant, whose uh, Typhonian trilogies are very much behind Invisible Sun, and Thomas Carlson, whose books on uh, Kabbalah and Klipoth are very much behind Kult. And so what I want to do is real quick do these two case studies, show the way that they, that they branch, show the way that they reconverge, and in so doing, can help benefit our practice of occultists. So um, let's start with case study current number one. So this is Invisible Sun. And Invisible Sun, I know I've mentioned it before. I always used, like to use it as an example. I've mentioned it at Trans States. But um, when you backed it on Kickstarter, there was really only one reward tier that cost like 350 British pounds. It was quite pricey, and it was called Summon the Black Cube. So what would happen is you would back it at this level, not knowing what you were going to get. And a year and a half later, this gigantic black cube would arrive on your doorstep, right? And, and you would sort of take it out, and it would unfold like the lament configuration from Hellraiser. And there, there were all these like weird little drawers and hidden compartments and strange tchotchkes and like a circular tarot deck. And then also a resin sculpture of a six-fingered left hand, which is at the center of the game. And one of the things about Invisible Sun is that Monty Cook, its, uh, its designer, by the way, I think Monty Cook is the greatest tabletop designer of all time. I'm just going to put this out here. Uh, yeah, 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 he's incredible. Um, so, 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 so Monty Cook is quite conscious of the concept of magical currents. And um, you know he is because uh, in, in the middle of one of the books, this is The Path, which is the Game Master's book, there is a diagram called Some of the Major Currents of Magic. Now, the main current of magic that runs through Invisible Sun is called the Path of Suns. And it's kind of a modified version of the Sephiroth, the Tree of Life. And you'll see another kind of image of it in a second. But notice it's only one of several currents, because there's arrows drawn all over the place. And one of the currents is the night side current. And it's made up of black arrows, and it flows backwards. It flows back up the tree. And the reason we know that this concept of magical currents in, um, in Invisible Sun comes from Kenneth Grant is because Monty Cook spells it out for us. 
Um, you know, you can see resources and inspirations for Invisible Sun. I've enlarged the relevant section and sandwiched very honorably between David Bowie and Mike Mignola is Kenneth Grant. So that, you know, there he is. And, and what you can see is that um, Grant's sort of influence extends so far that when um, this supplement was released as a stretch goal, it's called The Night Side, right? In, in sort of direct allusion to the fourth volume of the Diphonian trilogies, which is Night Side of Eden. So there's the Path of Suns. It's the main current of Magic and Invisible Sun. You put circular tarot cards down on it when you cast spells in the game. And it brings me to Ludomantic left hand path technique number one, which is reverse and invert symbol systems, right? So you've got a symbol system that you've created in your game, in your practice. Turn it upside down, turn it backwards, see what new possibilities of play that opens up. And um, Monty Cook is well aware that this is a scary you know, possibility that fills him with trepidation to the point that the book for the night side actually comes in a little <laughs> silk bag with a purple sigil on it and instructions that say keep this separate from the rest of the game. And there's even a die that is the inverse of the typical die in Invisible Sun because it's blank on every side except one. It's a blank black die and the one symbol that's on it is the flux symbol that invokes chaos. So if you play with this, you're playing a dangerous game, like literally. And um, Monty Cook like, deliberately associates this with the left-hand path. So you can see the sign read night side path with an arrow pointing left. And below that, it said path of suns with an arrow to the right. Funny, Trevain said. Yeah, Nier said. If someone ever asks about it without any irony, that's a good reason to tell them to just go home. And it's for good reason that, that, that um, Cook sort of uh, you know, encompasses his sense of the left-hand path with a degree of humor and play and irony in that the abilities that, associate, that are associated with the game are quite scary. Um, renounces the light is one of them and it can be expressed in two words, I hate. I hate, I reject and renounce the conventional morality of the world around me. I want to point out that renouncing the light, which you can see as sort of a skill tree there, uh, which has a node called Tap the Primal Current, I think is an allusion to Kenneth Grant's unofficial 10th volume of uh, the Typhonian trilogy, his fictional or hyper-fictional novel Against the Light, a Nightside <laughs> narrative. And what's cool is not only is this influence sort of acknowledged by designers, but it's also uh, received by players. They're aware of it. So this is like an RPG review site. And you can see the line in it where a player sort of says, more accurately, this surreal modern fantasy RPG is an ambitious simulation of the occult philosophies of Hermeticism, Thelema, and the magician's process of self-actualization, the quote unquote, left hand path. So now that we've kind of tapped that current, let's, let's pick up a converging current, sort of a branch. And, and so let's move to Sweden for a moment because this game is a Swedish game, at least originally, called Kult. Kult is up to its fourth edition now. Um, the first edition started in the 90s and kicked off the Swedish version of the Satanic Panic, um, which occurred because somebody decided to sell copies of Kult in toy stores right next to the Teddy Ruxpin. And um, this was a little bit dangerous because you can see there's like bondage angels all over it and, and, and it's a little bit worrisome. Um, but this did come back in its fourth edition in 2018 as Kult Divinity Lost. And if I had to summarize um, Kult as a game, I would say it's Gnosticism and Left Hand Hath Path Kabbalah, the role playing game. Like that's basically what it is. To the point that like if I excerpt from its lore, there is a suspiciously named in-game character named Theodore Mimesis, who writes a grimoire called Human Gnosis, in which he says, we saw clearly and had the power to act, but the demiurge stole our divinity and locked our senses. You shall be blind to truth and only see what is false. Your powers are fettered in your twin souls, and never again shall they become part of you, said the demiurge, and locked us in the prison of reality. We are fallen angels shipwrecked in a false reality, which hides even the fact that we are prisoners. Now, I think Theodore Mimesis is pretty transparently a fictionalized Hans Jonas, 
Uh, so Hans Jonas was the uh, mid-20th century scholar of religion who wrote uh, the Gnostic religion, the message of the alien God in the beginnings of Christianity, because the version that's being expressed in that bit of lore is an existentialist interpretation of Gnosticism as a hermeneutics of reversal. So it's this idea of the Gnostics taking Plato's Demiurge, who's basically a benevolent uh, and maybe even a neutral or, or maybe even benevolent figure, reinterpreting him and the biblical Yahweh or Jehovah as archons, as demonic oppressive rulers who have to be overturned. And what you can see is that um, even sort of the structure of the rule book in Kult, this is the, uh, this is the third edition, sort of turns the cosmology on its head. So everything that we usually associate with role-playing games, like weapons and character classes, is just described as the lie because it's material, it's stuff, it's not real. The, the things that deal with magic and drugs and anything that pushes at the edges of the mundane world is the rumors or the madness. Um, and, and the truth is the, the last and longest part of that book, which is the actual left-hand path Gnostic cosmology of cult, which everybody on the game is trying to reach toward. Now, what we can see is that the designers of the fourth edition of cult, they are well aware of their inspirations. Um, on their official Facebook page, they list them off. They're mostly fictional, so there's a lot of Clive Barker, there's a lot of Hellraiser, um, there's a lot of John Constantine Hellblazer, um, but there's also two works of real occult um, kind of scholarship, both of them by Thomas Carlson, Kabbalah, Klippoth, and Goetic Magic, and what was translated in English as Amongst Mystics and Magicians in Stockholm. And so Thomas Carlson is the, you know, Swedish uh, original founder of Le Dragon Rouge, which was a, a satanic left-hand path group. And Carlson's Klepothic vision of the left-hand path just flows directly into cult to the point that it's taking its cosmological diagrams, its kind of dark reversed um, Kabbalistic tree of life, like directly from um, you know, Carlson's kind of uh, diagrams of, of the Klepoth. And really what it's doing is these left-hand path influences are functioning as a sort of anti-world building principle, right? So there's a lot of talk in game design about creating immersive worlds and simulations, but ludomantic left-hand path technique number two is to construct anti-worlds, to deny and resist all that is not divine, including divinity. So one of the ideas that Carlson sort of talks about is the notion that Satan or the opposer takes residence in the anti-worlds of the, the shells of the dead, of the Klippoth, not because he hates God, but because he loves God so much that he's opposed to the existence of anything but Ein Sof. He's opposed to the existence of anything that is, that is not pure, formless void. Um, nevertheless, one of the things that the cult designers sort of engage in is an extended exercise in personification of these forces of darkness. So not only do you get sort of the standard um, clip oath, but you also get kind of factions like the sons of Chakidiel or the blood angels of Satheriel, who are kind of extensions of and elaborations upon the forces of the left-hand path, which brings us to left-hand path ludomantic technique number three, which is personify the dark. Uh, Carlson's argument is that Lurianic Kabbalah and the branches that kind of extend out of it personify the emanations of the left by giving them proper names. Um, it's easier to play with something if it has a face, if it has an image to be associated with it. And this is one of the techniques that's going on here. But the other thing is that since we're dealing with games, um, with play and rules and mechanics at the heart of them, we have ludomantic left-hand path technique number four, which is simulate the dark path to awakening. So here's how Kult does this. It says, okay, your players are trying to become awakened. They're trying to wake up from the lie. They're trying to see sort of past the, the, the illusory material world. They can do this in two ways. One is the standard way. So meditation and um, basically becoming in harmony with the universe so that they can raise their mental balance. Or they can do it the other way, which is to deliberately destroy their mental balance. So what you sort of end up getting is two paths to awakening in cult one of which involves maxing out your mental balance points to the point that they can't go any further and you wake up, or destroying your mental balance points to the point that they can't get any lower and you wake up, but in a different way. 
Now, I could give you all kinds of images of this. I don't really want to dwell on it. Um, Kult does simulate taboo behaviors. Um, we have to keep in mind, I think, that transgression is a moving target. So, um, you know, a lot of the imagery is BDSM, a lot of it's gender shifting. Um, there's a fair bit of spells that have names like master and slave or fetus perversion. There's a lot of emphasis on pacts with entities beyond the veil, archons and death angels. There's a lot of emphasis on, on kind of working with dreams. But what I want to do now, having taken these two kind of branches of the left-hand path current and, and explored the way they fork, is I want to zoom out a little bit. And I want to give some context that will bring things together in my, in my nine remaining minutes. So here I go. Uh, this is Matu Smokri, and I'm sorry, I'm almost certainly mispronouncing his name. But he gave what I thought was the best talk at Esui 9. It was fantastic. And he was talking about um, different left-hand path attitudes toward animal sacrifice. So Matus sort of describes the left-hand path as being a modern movement from the 1960s and 70s that defines itself as antinomian, which is to say against the law, and individualistic. And he does this beautiful, rigorous, comparative study of left-hand path thinkers and the way that they sort of negotiate the idea of animal sacrifice in the modern world um, on different criteria like magical efficacy, respectability, and metaphysics. And so Matus, you know, this is kind of my paraphrase of his diagram, but that this is the framework within, within which he analyzed. So he says, okay, you've got Satanists like LeVay, who, who are sort of like, the point of being a Satanist is to accumulate wealth and power, uh, to, to sort of attain power within the world. And so therefore, in the modern world anyway, we want to avoid animal sacrifice in order to preserve respectability, because we don't want to lose that. Um, okay, so that's an approach. On the right-hand side, we have kind of the Finnish Satanists associated with the um, publishing company Ixacar, who say the opposite thing, which is um, that, that, it's, that it's almost required for a practitioner to sacrifice animals because there's magical efficacy in the blood, it calls to the spirits that we want to call to, and so on. And I was thinking about that as I was you know, watching Matusse's talk, and I was like, neither of those visions is particularly good for game-based transgression. Because um, there's a lot of blood in games, and there's a lot of killing. And originally, I had a bunch of slides of all of the iterations of Mortal Kombat, and how the blood goes from pixelated blood to slightly more realistic to hyper-realistic blood. But the thing is, there's nothing particularly transgressive about that, right? It, it's just more and more uh, visually realistic visions of blood. And at the, under, the other end of things, the kind of avoiding you know, animal sacrifice and violence to preserve respectability, well, down that path leads Candy Crush. You know, it, we, we, we sort of end up in a place where it's like, okay, well, my game's not violent, but it's still really shallow, shallow and it's trapping me in the material world and, and you know, it's not so good. So I, I, I was, this was sort of bothering me. And then Matus mentioned Kenneth Grant. And Kenneth Grant's got an entirely different approach because what he does is he reinterprets the bloody sacrifice as menstrual blood, right? Because he's a Thelemite. And he's quoting that bit from Lieber Al about the best blood is of the moon monthly. And, and so his vision of... Um, Kenneth Grant's vision of, of the bloody sacrifice ends up being about mentally based sexed magic, which is designed to access a vision of non-dualism at the heart of an unconscious void. So after Matus finished speaking, I raised my hand and I said, Matus, I really liked that talk, but how is mentally based sex magic connected to the accessing of non-dualism at the heart of an, uh, of an unconscious void? And he looked at me and he said, I don't know. I told you, I don't know. So I spent the next six months reading the Typhonian trilogies and trying to figure this out and, and how we might apply it to games. And what I sort of came up with is this. Kenneth Grant is using um, both the standard tree of life and, and the reverse or night side of the tree of life. He's mapping it onto a psychosexual map of the human body. He's inverting it, he's turning it upside down. And what this means is that da'ath, the broken or missing sephiroth, which is often described as an abyss that needs to be either avoided or crossed, 
becomes for him a portal. And it's a very specific physical portal. So what he argues is that he translates the, the Vama Marg as woman path, um, arguing that it's because of the use of woman and sex magic. I don't like that word use, but we'll, we'll give him a pass because he's writing in the 1970s and, and we'll move on. But he hits this moment. And what he ends up doing is he ends up saying that the bleeding vagina is the portal of Da'oth, and where it leads to is universe B. Universe B is the backside of the tree of life. It's what happens if you reverse and invert your symbol system. I want to tell you that the quotation that I'm about to read to you is my favorite quotation that I have ever put in a slide. And here I go. The Ein Eye as Naya is the eye reversed, not the eye of the light, but the eye of the dark, the occult eye, the vulva in its negative phase, the witch moon of blood, the lunar eclipse. So what Kenneth Grant is doing is he's suggesting that what moves through that portal is an influx of non-being against being, what he refers to as the dwellers in universe B, who are the negatively existent ones. And he's sort of saying that this crack in space is a place through which things can emerge that are not existent but are real. He's playing with the notion of the via negativa, of negative theology, or as he translates it, the via negationis. Now, I'm gonna bring it back to games because there is a concept in LARPing, live action role playing, that describes the deliberate allowing of events and emotions from the real world to seep into the game and vice versa. And the name for that concept is Bleed. And Bleed, coined by the LARP designer Emily Kerboss, uh, here it is on the Nordic LARP wiki, is the idea, is the sensation uh, when emotions bleed over between character, player or character in either direction. So ludomantic uh, left hand path technique number five is to embrace bleed. And to understand why that's important, we have to sort of understand this concept of the magic circle. So in classic orthodox game studies, going back to the very founder of game studies, whose name is Johann Huizinga, Huizinga says that games take place within a sanctified and separated magic circle. So this is the notion that if you um, kick a soccer ball into a net in real life, nothing happens and it doesn't mean anything. But if you do it in the middle of a soccer game or a football game, you just scored a goal and it might be really important. Huizinga says this is just like a magician standing in a circle that separates them from the demonic forces outside. But the left-hand path of game design is the opposite of that. It's deliberately allowing the magic circle to break and forces of non-being, which are nevertheless real, to enter in from the other side. In other words, it's what Andrew Chumbly, Magister of the Cultist Sabbatai, alludes to in the Rite of the Opposer, and specifically the section which he entitles the Prayer of the Design, which says, I am the transgressor of void eternal, Azal Abad, in whom all is opposition. And in my last two minutes, let me bring it home. I have the left end path ludomantic technique number six, contest the light. Remember that video games are by their nature bright media in which the movement of light pixels creates illusory form. There's a lot of toxicity in so-called gamer culture. Um, the left hand path of game design means to um, allow games to operate as a cult practice to embrace their darker side and their capacity to evoke bleed uh, between the real world, the world beyond, and the unreal world, which can lead to a light beyond the light. So to sum up, six uh, techniques of ludomantic left-hand path practice. Reverse game-based symbol systems to access alternate currents of energy. Develop anti-worlds in which exiled spiritual forces can dwell. Personify forces of darkness as potent, powerful, imaginal allies. Simulate transgressive behaviors as a path to enlightenment. Embrace bleed between what is and is not, being and non-being. And most of all, contest the light in the name of a greater light, the black sun. Thank you very much. Yeah.